this morning I want to begin by giving you some funny sayings that our mothers taught us. Okay, disclaimer here is that they are funny. They can be true, but they are funny. My mother taught me about genetics. She constantly said, you look just like your father. My mother taught me about stamina. She said, you'll sit there until your spinach is finished. She taught me about the circle of life. She said, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. All right, I remember that. My mother taught me about medicine. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, they're going to freeze that way. My mother taught me about farming roots. She said, what, were you born in a barn? Especially when your boys pee outside the toilet seat. All right. Um, my mother taught me about the wisdom of age. She said, um, when you get to be my age, you'll understand. My mother taught me about receiving. She said, you're going to get it when I get home. <laughs> That's funny. My mother taught me how to meet a challenge. She said, what were you thinking, child? Answer me. And then she turns around and she says, stop talking back to me. That's interesting, I thought. She taught me about anticipation and justice. She said, just wait until your father gets home. My mother taught me about irony. She said, keep crying and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> when I read those stuff, I thought, how funny are they? We thank God for the opportunity to celebrate Mother's Day. I want to take a moment to uh, wish my mother, who is looking uh, through online at the moment, and I want to say, Mom, I love you so, so, so much. You are the most amazing, amazing mom. And Leah and I are so blessed, and all our children are so blessed. You are such a blessing to me, and I want to publicly thank you for who you are and what you've instilled in my life. I love you, Mom, so very much. She's amazing. And I remember growing up, my dad just going to McDonald's to buy, um, you know, pancakes and lattes for my mom. Seriously, there were such fond memories. And even my um, children growing up, you know, my daughter, she's doing words this morning. She has the most amazing ability to round up the boys to get me breakfast in bed. I know the boys, some of the boys are married now, but she actually gets Ezekiel and Leo getting me breakfast in bed. She's a special, special, special young lady. And I so love having my daughter and my grandson. Yes, right in the front. While we all celebrate Mother's Day this morning, Leah said that Mother's Day could be Mother's Day, oops, Mother's Day could be difficult because either, you know, we haven't had the greatest mother growing up or maybe you've lost your mother or maybe, you know, um, you haven't had a tender-hearted mother or maybe you've had miscarriages. Maybe, you know, you're on a journey to have a child. Whatever you are going through, whatever the emotion you're going through this morning, I want to prophetically declare that God is wanting to bring breakthrough into our lives. So I do not want you leaving this morning without getting prayer this morning. Amen. Because we want to pray with you. We serve a good God who is wanting to meet you where you are at. And He's wanting to be the honey. He's wanting to bring honey into your lives. And the only way we can do that is when we're connected to the rock. Amen. So um, I don't know who needs to hear this, but I, when I was preparing, I felt like the Father is saying to say it to some of you this morning, I love you more than you can ever imagine. More than you can ever imagine. Right now, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to 3 John chapter 1, verses 2 through to 4. This passage is is so, so important to me because it gave me some perspective and uh, as a mother, as a leader, as a friend, and I, I pray it does the same for you this morning. So let's read. It says here, dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are healthy in your body and you are strong in spirit. Some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me about your faithfulness and that you are living according to the truth. I could have no greater joy than to hear my children are following in the truth. 
This Mother's Day morning, you know, just like any other mother, every mother here knows that they want to give the best to their children. As your spiritual mom, I want to impart some truths to you this morning from the Word of God. And I pray these truths are a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Amen. John says that I have no greater joy than to hear my children are following in the truth. You know, John uh, here is, uh, you know, wrote this third and brief epistle about his friend Gaius, whom he loved so dearly and saw him as a spiritual child. This man whom John loved was being faithful to the truth of the gospel. His actions and his attitude reflected Christ to the believer and to the non-believer, causing John to write this very parental and maternal sentiment that says that I have no greater joy than to hear my children are following in the truth. I believe this expression of John is the sentiment of every parent, every caregiver, every leader, every mentor, right? I mean, children following in the truth, I believe is an excellent desire and an excellent goal. Do you agree? Yeah, so as a people in love with Jesus, eager to follow the Great Commission in making disciples of all nations, I believe our primary responsibility and mission field lies in discipling our children. In discipling our children, you know, the job of raising our children is not just to get them into adulthood and make them responsible members of society, our responsibility so far as it depends on us is to grow them up in the fear and the knowledge of God. Amen. Amen. But let me tell you, our journey, however, in raising them up this way, there's a prerequisite on us as parents and leaders. I don't know if you realize that. And the prerequisite is that we too are to follow Christ primarily, continually, consistently falling in love with Jesus every single moment of every single day before we lead our children. Because then we know that they are following in the ways of truth. Amen. When scripture says, I have no greater joy than to hear my children are following in the truth, it begs the question, what is truth? Because there's your truth, there's my truth, there's our truth. But I don't know about you, I want to know the truth. I want to know the truth. I want to know how to follow the truth. I want to know how to lead my children th through the truth. Whether you are a spiritual a leader or a mother or a man. I had some Buddhist friends <clears throat> and I remember in their teaching it was said that there is a way, there is truth, there is life. But you and I know that through scripture it says in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Amen. According to Jesus, he's the definition of truth, guys. He's the definition of truth. He is truth. And so as I journeyed like this, you know, for this Mother's Day, I thought, God, what is it that you're wanting to give to your people? What is it that you're wanting to tell the mothers, the children, the spiritual uh, children in this house, the physical children in this house? You know, so as I studied, uh, you know, uh, furthermore, I looked up the definition, but the definition does not... Uh, the definition gives us no inclination as truth being a person. But it says that truth is a body of real things, events, and actuality, um, you know, facts, so to speak. But then how can Jesus be the truth? And is the definition wrong? Not to say that we should be following a definition, but hold on. I'm going to take you through a journey. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word. In timelessness and eternity, the Word of God existed. And the Word was God, and the, uh, uh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, He was with God in the beginning. Now the Word of God is a He. The li true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Hold on to a second, I'm getting somewhere juicy. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John gives us 
are three vital facts as Jesus being the truth. First fact, John says that the word logos, the word log, uh, the word in this um, passage of scripture is called logos. You know, it's something God said, something he thought, something he reasoned, all pre-existed, you know, before the foundations of the world, before anything ever was. The second fact, John, the fact that John reveals is that the word is a being and not an it. You know, he was with God and, you know, it says he was with God and he was God. And John goes on to say that the word became flesh. He became flesh. Jesus being the word of God described as the Logos became flesh. The writers of Hebrews says that Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father. And in Colossians it says, in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. You see, the third fact that John argues is that this person whom you know and made, it, made and ordered the universe into being came into humanity in and through Jesus. You see, the most spectacular event in history, God taking on flesh, being a human, you know, Christ clothing himself uh, in humanity, he just wanted to display what truth looked like. So am I saying the definition that I explained earlier is wrong? Not really. As a Christian, we believe the definition of truth existed in the heart of God before anything ever was. And guess what? You and I can go, you know, because it says the definition is facts and, and it's actuality and events. Jesus came to display everything, to live out God's truth. And we have it written in our word. So we get to, as parents, as mothers, go into the word and see for ourselves how to live out the truth. He did not merely teach truth, sp speak truth, live out truth. He is truth. Amen? He is truth. Let me give you an example of something further. When Jesus was arrested, he found himself standing before Pilate, right? He was accused of blasphemy because he had, uh, it was rumored that he called himself a king and he was stirring up a people to a revolution and then Pilate was so fascinated by Jesus' talk in John 18 and pushing back on the idea, this is what Pilate says to Jesus. He says, so you are king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I'm king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify or bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of truth hears my voice. Everyone who is of truth this morning hears his voice. I hope you're hearing that. Then Pilate's response comes in a form of a question. He says, what is truth? What is truth? You see, this question has been asked through the centuries by the humanity. But for, because for Pilate, truth was relative. The truth was that Jesus was innocent and he wasn't worthy of being crucified. But the Jews believed their version of truth. You see, Jews believed that Jesus was deserving of death. So much for relative truth. I wrote here, if all truth changes from person to person and situation to situation, and there's no firm ground, no reference point, we are walking in danger. You see, Jesus already answered the question, what is truth? He said, even before Pilate asked the question, he says, I have come to bear witness to the truth. I've come to demonstrate the truth. Amen. Anyone who hears his voice lives in that truth. And in John says, you shall know the truth. You shall know Jesus and your life will be set free. I believe sometimes we go around situations and circumstances and we find ourselves in a hole because we're not encountering the truth every single day of our life. We're not pursuing the truth. Truth means Jesus. We're not pursuing him enough to know what truth is for that situation. I want to say our attitude towards truth will determine 
the outcome to our life. If we love the truth, we embrace Him and we embrace salvation. But if we reject the truth, we reject Him and everything that entails with Him. So as mothers and caregivers and leaders this morning, I want us to embrace the truth. I want us to love the truth and don't think, oh my gosh, she's talking about something heavy, but it's not. You know, loving the truth means loving Jesus and everything that entails Jesus because He is... uh, Uh, He is the center, he's the beginning, he's the end, he's the middle of truth. Amen? So in Henry Blackaby's devotional, he puts it this way. I was reading a devotional this week and he says, The disciples thought that they were about to die in the storm. There were fishermen who knew the sea and they knew that the conditions they were in and they trusted their own expertise and wisdom and And in doing so, they had allowed their circumstances to convince them that their truth was that their death was imminent. But they were so wrong. Rather than recognizing that the truth was asleep in the back of their boat, they relied on their own expertise. Scripture says, lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Guess what? You know, when Jesus got up and spoke to the storm, because they, the disciples were in the middle of a storm, you know, uh, there was absolute calm. There was absolute calm. You know, he commanded the uh, uh, storm to stop. You see, we need to get and uh, get into the Word of God and know our Jesus, know our truth. And we need to do warfare with the truths of God that has given us into our lives for our children. Mothers, if you're standing um, in the middle and standing firm for your children, your warfare weapon is the Word of God because there are promises that you can anchor yourself onto and say, I'm going to do warfare. I'm not going to let the enemy or my circumstances show me that my imminent circumstances are death or it's not a good um, way that I'm heading because Jesus knows all truth. Amen. We also, I wrote here, we also need to validate the truth that we hear with the Word of God. Otherwise, if we end up believing a truth masqueraded as a lie, we're going to suffer friction between us and God. So be careful to teach God's Word and His truth that comes out of the Word to our children, to ourselves. You know, base, your base point is the Word of God. Amen? So... What was John referring to when he said, I could have no greater joy than to hear my children are following in the truth? Well, the first truth that John goes after is the truth about sin. He wants us to know the truth about sin. He's saying the truth about sin is that if you sin, there's a a breakdown in your relationship between you and God. Let me give you an uh, uh, let me give you an alternative story. I remember Josiah was like two or three years old, and he was playing with Kristen um, at church. And this little boy of mine, um, he was in this lion face and growling face and biting face. And I remember I was at the front of the auditorium. He was always prancing around the building, and then I could see him at the back playing with Kristen. And then this cheeky little boy looks over his shoulder, looks to see if I was looking. This is what sin does. Looks over the shoulder to see if I was looking. And he leans into Kristen. You and I know who Kristen is. And bites Kristen on the arm kind of thing. And I said, Josiah. And he still went ahead and did it. This is heart-wrenching. And this even happened at preschool where I get Uh, You know, they asked me to the principal's office and we go through all the discipline stuff. It was quite crazy period. It's heart-wrenching when you realize for the first time your kids are going to sin, right? But it's even more devastating when you realize that your kids have sinned and crushed under the weight of sin and are ashamed of sin. And with this heart, John says, my little children, I'm writing to you these things so that you may not sin. 
Writing to you what things? Well, I'm going to tell you what things. He's saying God is in the light and in him there's no darkness at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness, meaning go on living in sin. We're not practicing the truth. John was saying, don't sin. Try your hardest not to sin. Don't lie or deny to yourself that there is sin in your life because when when you deny it, you're not operating in truth. And when you are not operating in truth, you're operating darkness. And when you're operating darkness, you break fellowship with the Father. And with that mind, John goes on to say, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for us only, but for those of the whole world. You see, the word propitiation means sacrifice. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice that appeased the wrath of God for you and I. You tell your children, don't even be tempted to sin. But if you do sin, guess what? Let them know that there's an advocate for them and for yourselves. Amen? Michael Eaton, you guys may not know of this person, but he said, how holy do you expect to be? Well, I can tell you one thing. You will never be so holy in this life that you do not need the blood of Jesus. John does not want you to sin, but he immediately makes it clear that he knows you will. The godliest of people never feel that they have arrived. You will, ne you will need Jesus every day of your life. You need him as your advocate. Don't try to dispense with him. Don't try to struggle to produce a day in your life when you say, today I did not sin. I don't need the blood of Jesus. You will need it every day of your life. The blood of Jesus is to be used. Uh, it is embarrassing day after day to need the blood uh, to cleanse us of our sins, but don't get so holy that you feel like you don't need it. We need his blood every single day. The second truth that John goes after is how to work out your relationships. Who needs to know how to work out their relationships? Whether with your partners, with your children, your spouse, your leaders. John goes after this truth. You see, I hate it when my kids fight. Because guess what? They're not loving one another. There's, the peace is disrupted in the family you know, I want to intentionally show them what it means to navigate a healthy relationship and not hold on to grudges, bitterness, hurt, offense, and let it linger and let them transfer it to their kind, uh, kids. We want to know how to navigate good relationships. John says this, the one who says he's in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. And the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because darkness, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. It's, an it's quite interesting how scripture goes after the importance of healthy relationships for the kingdom, for the furtherance of the kingdom. Can I be transparent with you this morning? You know, probably not too, in a not too distant future, I was struggling with bitterness in my heart. And um, I found myself in this struggle and I found that I was wallowing in it and I was clouded by it and I was crushed under the weight of it. And it's only because I hadn't surrendered the circumstances of myself to the Lordship of Jesus and asked Him Jesus, what is it that you would have me see? What is it that you would want me seeing in these circumstances? But rather, I was caught up in my own emotion. But thank goodness for the fathers of the faith and the leaders of the faith who called me up on it. And they referred me to Hebrews 12, which I'm going to take you through. Because this chapter deals with bitterness. It deals with hardships of relationships. It deals with endurance. You, you name it, it's got it all. 
this chapter starts with saying, stripping every weight that slows us down, run the race with endurance by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, who because of the joy awaiting him endured the cross and disregarded the hostility and the struggles of all difficult people. Then it goes on to remind us, don't make light of discipline because the father disciplines those he loves. This morning, even though this message might seem, oh, it seems a bit disciplinary, but it's not my word, it's his word. And it says he disciplines those he loves. And I want to be so open to his correction. I want to be so transparent. I do not want the filth and the muck in my life being transferred to my kids and my kids taking it into their relationship. I want to break those cycles and those vicious thoughts and those things that would hold us running the race. Amen. And then it says, it says in verse 12, therefore strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level path for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather he healed. God is calling us to live healed so we minister from a place of healing, like I said earlier. Amen. Uh, make every effort to live in peace with everyone, everyone. Everyone, the scripture says everyone, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no, no one falls short of the grace of God and no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The truth to remember about relationships is that when you have a short-term relationship, it's easy. But when it's long-term, guess what? It can be hard, but it's not impossible, God is saying. You know, he's saying, Jesus went to the cross because he thought long-term with us, amen? Any good relationship needs to have endurance. What do I mean endurance? Persistent, persistence, you know, enduring, handling the weather. And how do we endure? Good discipline, Good discipline. Any, you know, if you guys do any type of training, you know it can be brutal and exhausting. But if you keep the discipline, let me tell you, endure the discipline, you get into that sweet rhythm and you get into that sweet flow. Sometimes when we have been placed in long-term relationships and when we get fatigued and exhausted and when we feel like we want to give up and we feel hopeless, verse 12 is basically saying, snap out of it, straighten out, re-engage your focus back on him. Because let me tell you, when you are training, if you are fatigued and exhausted and you start training, guess what? Your form gets bad. And if your form gets bad, guess what? You end up getting hurt because you're not doing the exercises properly. Let me tell you, if you do not re-engage your life back on Jesus with your relationship, your form will get hurt and you'll end up hurting the people around you. So we need to re-engage our focus back on him. We need to model what a healthy relationship looks like. And then it shows you how to pursue healthy relationship. It says pursue peace with everyone. And when you look up this word pursue, it's not just, oh, let me pursue peace. It's actually a tactical pursuing like you're pursuing an enemy. It says be strategic in the way you pursue peace. Don't be laxidacy about it. Pursue peace vigilantly. Watch your work. Words, watch your action, watch your mouth, watch how you deal with things, pursue peace, amen. Then secondly, it says pursue holiness. Sometimes you go through stuff and this, you feel like in a, in, um, in a relationship, this invisible line gets crossed and you feel deep inside, okay, that's it, she crossed it, gloves are off. Let me tell you, there's no time in our Christian walk with God, we can say gloves are off. Never in our Christian walk with God can we ever say because somebody crossed our line, gloves are off. We don't have the luxury of saying that. Let me say that. And thirdly, it says pursue grace. See to it that no one for sure fails to obtain grace of God, that, that no root of bitterness springs up and cause trouble, and by it many become defiled. 
Let me say this morning, no matter who has brushed you off, no matter who has hurt you, no matter who has dis, um, honored you, it's no excuse for our behavior. No excuse that we behave wrongly back to them. And when we feel bitter, I'm going to ask you to worship God. You know, spend time with him because then he extends grace to you. And when that grace is extended, we can extend that grace back to the other person. The third truth, you know, he says uh, he wants to go after is the truth about shame. Let me read it, uh, read it to you. 1 John 2, 28. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from shame. See what kind of the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. You see, when teenagers hide in their room, there are only few reasons why they hide in their room. Number one, it's because I'm on their war path, because I'm after them because they've done something wrong. Secondly, they hide in the room because they don't want to do their chores, right? They don't want to do their chores. Thirdly, could be possibly because they're feeling the shame of a sin that, they, you know, they're struggling with a sin that they have committed, so they're hiding away in their room. You see, sometimes in church, I find some of the uh, church family tend to do that as well, including myself, where we've done something and we hide away. We, you know, walk away from family when we need to be in community and we hide. And, you know, um, I feel like John was basically saying, don't shrink back. You're a child of the living God. Don't uh, withdraw. Embrace him because he loves you so, so dearly. John was basically saying, come boldly into the throne room of God because you will receive mercy and grace. Amen. Fourth truth. It's, John writes here is about truth about idols. He said, as a mom, I understand this because growing up, I remember our kids were forming friendships. Some of them were good. Some of them were not so good. And it's quite heart-wrenching when you see, uh, that might not be healthy. And with that in mind, John writes this, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Little children, guard yourself from idols. I think I was about 14 years old and this guy was pursuing me as friends, so to speak. Um, and then my mom and dad, I know they're watching. I remember my mom and dad put a stop to it straight away. And I was so mad. I was so angry. And I did not understand. But I thank God that they put a stop to it because I would not be where I am today doing what God has called me to do if I had pursued that relationship. Let me read you this amazing, amazing quote by Timothy Keller. It says, an idol, idolatrous attachment can lead you to break any promise, rationalize any indiscretion, or betray any other allegiance in order to hold on to it. It may drive you to violate all good and proper boundaries, to practice idolatries, to be a slave. If we look to some created thing to give us meaning, hope, and happiness that only God himself can give, it will eventually fail to deliver. John is wanting, to, wanting us to know the truth about idols. And the truth is, idols are bullies. Church, children of God, my physical kids, I want to say, be careful, be watchful about the idols that surround you. Amen. We need to say, according to Psalms 86, 11, teach me your ways, I will walk in your truth. And in conclusion, you know, if I was to rewrite, if I was to summarize everything I shared with you this morning, I would phrase it this way to my children, to my church family. So I want you to hear out, like, if you can just pause for a moment and listen to this letter from me to you. My dearest sons, my one and only Eva Princess Evangeline, my daughter in loves, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and my church family, my love for you is so deep and it'll never change. I'm writing to inform you about some deeply important things that will help you navigate life. 
Sorry. First and foremost, I want to address the truth about sin. The truth is that God's desire for you is not to sin. Try your hardest not to sin, but most importantly, do not make a habit of sin because sin breaks your fellowship with God. But if and when you do sin, do not panic. Do not withdraw. Do not hide in shame or isolate because you are afraid or embarrassed. I know you're not perfect and that's okay. I'm writing to let you know you have an advocate. Run to him. Cling to him. Speak to him. Learn from him. Admit your mistakes. Know that he has welcomed you just as you are. Furthermore, make good use of, he, uh, of the blood he shed. The blood of Jesus provides forgiveness of sin. His blood provides justification. His blood provides protection. We are healed by his blood. We're sanctified by his blood. We're redeemed by his blood. I know what you are and I can see what you're becoming. And I know who you're called to be. Just be assured that you will grow into all that he has for you. Your brothers and sisters and this church are a gift to you, even when it doesn't feel that way at times. They are also trying not to sin, even the ones you think that are perfect, but they too will make mistakes and sin, which may hurt you. Especially in these times, don't sin in reaction. Go to Jesus, you will find grace. You need to know that any godly relationships are worth enduring. Keep in mind, you will need to endure your love towards me, your love towards your dad, your love towards your siblings, your spouse, your children, and the people of God that has been placed in your life. Remember, relationships are a marathon and you will need endurance. Continue to lock your gaze on Him so you don't lose your form. And finally, be watchful over whom you idolize, even the ones you perceive as good. Idols are not worth trusting. Uh, idols are not trustworthy to pursue with all your heart. Save your devoted worship for the one that is perfect. Keep all of this in mind, my beloved children. I could have no greater joy than to hear my children are following in the truth. Can we please stand? You know, as a mom, I wanted to write that letter to my children, to my grandchildren, to my daughter in loves, to my beloved church who have done who I've done life with for 30 years. And if I had to leave you a will, that would be the will that I leave. No amount of earthly treasure can sum up you know, or even muster what you need for life. And in saying that, that's why I wanted to write that and say, church, Jesus loves you way more than you can ever begin to imagine. Even in our mistakes, even in our shortcomings, I'm not perfect, I'm far from it. And you can sit and chat to all my kids. I make big mistakes where I fall short of the grace of God. And the only reason that happens is because I am not spending enough time with my beloved. I'm not, I'm not at his feet. I'm not receiving of him. So then my relationships get stretched. And so as spiritual moms and spiritual caregivers and physical mom and physical caregivers, whoever you are, whether you're a dad, a mom, a son, a daughter, an aunt, an uncle, a relative, a best friend, the greatest gift I can leave with you is the gift of running to Jesus. Don't hide from sin. You have an advocate. You have an advocate. I have an advocate. That's the greatest gift I can leave for you. So can we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for my beautiful church family and my beautiful physical family. Lord God, I love them so dearly, so dearly. And as one mom to the church, 
I leave your truth, not my version of truth, but your truth to them, Lord God. And I pray that as they go into their lunches and as they go into their celebration, or even if they go into their quiet times or their homes, Father, I pray, may they begin to sense the tangible presence of our Papa, our Father, our Daddy in their homes in their bedrooms, in their works, in their coming and their going. Father, we are nothing without you. We are nothing without you. Father, I thank you right now that you release the fresh breath, fresh wind from heaven this morning over every single vessel that's here, every single person here, Lord God. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that there'll be such a tangible evidence of your glory and your anointing, visible display of your anointing and your peace and even breakthrough. Where there has been barrenness, let there be breakthrough. I speak breakthrough into those drought-stricken areas and relationships and rooms. Father, I speak life, life. Father, we, we know that we cannot expand your kingdom if we stick in our own tent. You have called us to be together, come together in union to expand your kingdom, Lord God. Father, may we lean to you. And Father, we say this morning, teach us your ways of truth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.